The materials for this message came from such mighty prophetical giants as Dr. L. Sale Harrison, Dr. DeHaan, Dr. Gabeline, Dr. Schofield, Dr. Marmion Lau, Dr. Charles Pont, Dr. Louis Talbot, Dr. Edmund, Dr. Larkin, Dr. Lockyer, Dr. Bauman, Dr. Dwight Pentecost, Dr. Wolver, Dr. Wilbur Smith. Other help came from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, the new Shafe Herzog Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge, historians Josephus, Gibbons, and others. And by the way, don't let all that scare you. I'm going to be using Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39 so often in this message that I'm not going to repetitiously name the book of Ezekiel. When I say 38, 6, I mean chapter 38, verse 6. 39, 12, chapter 39, verse 12. When I use other books, I'll name the books, but when I'm in Ezekiel, I'll stick to 38 and 39, and you'll know that I'm referring to the prophet Ezekiel. There are always those who are skeptical when a message like this is preached and say, oh, these preachers see what's going on in the world, so they try to find something in the Bible to fit the situation of the hour. Well, let me disprove that immediately. All one has to do is get a Schofield edition of the Bible, turn to Ezekiel 38, 39, read the footnotes, and Dr. Schofield says this is Russia, Moscow, and Tobolsk marching to the Middle East. But when did he say it? Turn to the front of the Schofield Bible and one immediately notices that the notes were copyrighted 1909. Not only that, but Dr. Gabeline in his book on Ezekiel, written in 1890, when he comes to this 38th and 39th chapter, says, This is Russia, Moscow and Tobolsk, marching to the Middle East. Now, how did these men know this 60, 70, 80 Years ago, had Bishop Lowthy in London, England, preaching it something like 215 years ago. Well, they could trace the names found in these two chapters with which we're going to deal and trace them through the encyclopedias, through history books, to cities in Russia presently. And we're going to do that. So we begin this message with the identification of the nations. Chapter 38, verse 1. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Here in chapter 38, verse 2, verse 5, verse 13, we see different names of tribes listed. And we're going to prove beyond any shadow of a doubt that these tribes or names are in existence today. Now notice carefully that all the names, details, and events of these Two chapters are for one time and one time only in history. The latter years, 38.8. The latter days, 38.16. Now, if all the names, details, and events of these chapters are for the latter years and latter days, then it's only reasonable to say that these names must be in existence somewhere in the latter years and latter days. And if they are, where are they? Who are they? We go back to Genesis chapter 10, verses 1 to 2. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Unto them were sons born after the flood. The sons of Japheth are Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, Tyrus. We immediately see that these are sons of Japheth who fathered the Gentile people and grandsons of Noah. After the experience of the flood, They settled in Asia Minor, became dissatisfied with that part of the world, and set out to locate in other areas of this globe in which we live. Now, the first name one sees is Gog, and it means nothing more or less than end-time ruler. However, here are two interesting sidelights. The Caucasus Mountains running throughout Russia in the Oriental tongue mean Fort of Gog, Gog's last stand. If you were to stand in Russia and say to a Russian, what do you call the tips, the tops, the heights of the Caucasus Mountains, he would say the Gog, G-O-G, with an H added to it. Now, though that is interesting, it really does not begin to tell us a lot. The names following do. Magog, Meshach, Tubal, and Harash, which we have just traced to Genesis chapter 10, where they originated, tell us that Magog with his tribe, left Asia Minor and went to the southern part of the land we now call Russia, settling where the Caucasus Mountains was his southern boundary. Proof? 
Josephus, Book 1, Chapter 6. This historian, who lived almost 2,000 years ago, stated that the Scythians were called Magog or Megagites by the Greeks. What's important about that? Well, the Scythians are given the credit for populating Russia, and these Scythians, I repeat it, were called Magog or Megagites by the Greeks. The next name one sees is Meshach. He with his tribe left Asia Minor and went to the western part of the land we now call Russia, settling in what is presently called Moscow. The original name was Meshach, then Mosach, then Muscovy, and now Moscow, the western capital. That's why Dr. Schofield many, many years ago said Moscow for Meshach. That's why Dr. Gabeline back in 1890 said Moscow for Meshach. The next name one encounters is Tubal. He with his tribe left Asia Minor, went to the eastern part of the land we now call Russia, settling in the areas of Siberia. Now this one is the easiest to prove to oneself that Russia is definitely going to play a part in the great battle in the Middle East before the Battle of Armageddon. Why? Put your hand upon a world map, run it over to the USSR, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, and then find Siberia, and southwest of Siberia on the map is Tobolsk. Well, you say, in the Bible it's Tobol, on the map it's Tobolsk. Why? Because the SK, a Russian suffix, has been added to the ending of the names of the cities in the Siberian area. Plus, it's the Greek spelling, Tobol. But it's the identical tribe that settled right there 2,500 years ago. And Tobolsk presently is the eastern capital, while Moscow is the western capital. Now, do you see why Dr. Schofield and why Dr. Gabeline many years ago identified these names as Moscow and Tobolsk and said there would be a great conflagration? in the Middle East, in the last times. Do you know that Gary Powers, the U-2 pilot, was shot down in Tobolsk? Oh, my friend, we're living in tremendous times when we can see these very cities before our eyes in Russia and realize that the Bible says that in the last days Russia will march in the Middle East and everything concerning Russia now has to do with the Middle East. Christ is coming soon. The next name is Rash. Now, if you look at your version of the Bible, notice that it says chief prince. Well, you say, where do you get Rash? All right. The Bible was written, as far as the Old Testament is concerned, in Hebrew, the New and Greek. If you had a Jewish version of the Bible, the Hebrew, in your hand, you would find in it R-O-S-H, Rash. But in your English version, it's been translated chief. Why? Because they translated the meaning of Rosh into the English chief rather than making it a name, Rosh. I believe the best way to illustrate this is through my name, Jack. Now, you see, a Jack is a person. I'm Jack. But a Jack also holds up a car while changing a tire. So here's the sentence, Jack is strong. And instead of making Jack a person, the translator does the following. That which holds up a car while changing a tire is strong. A mistake has been made. They put the meaning of Jack rather than my name, Jack. That's what they did here. They put the meaning of Rash rather than the name Rash. Now this is important. For Rash was the tribe dwelling in the area of the Volga. The Greeks called the Scythians Magog or Megagites, but the Orientals called the same Scythians Rosh, R-O-S-H. Today, as we pick up the headlines of papers in America, we read R-U-S-S, Rosh. In Belgium and Holland, Rosh, from the root word Rash. But here is conclusive proof. Dr. Wilbur Smith, that great prophetical scholar, got the writings from Russia on how the Russians got their modern name Russia. And remember, the Russians are telling us this. 
and the story goes back to the 11th century when the northern barbarian hordes were attacking Constantinople. Phocius the emperor said, who are these northerners? They seem to have no name. And he searched everything and came to the word of God, chapter 38, to Arash. Arash. He checked out the geography, which I'm going to give you in a moment, and came to one conclusion and said, these people from the north, uttermost north, which we presently identify as Russia, these people have to be the Arash. Of this verse. Do you know that for the next 700 years in history, the nations of the world call these people Rash or the Greek Rusia and change it from Rash and Rusia just a little over 200 years ago to the modern Russia? Oh, what a God! What a book! to give us the very details of who will be involved in the Middle East conflagration and give it to us 2,500 years in advance. Man couldn't have done this. Only God could have done it. And that's why we believe that the Bible is the word of the living God. Now, if this isn't enough for you, consider the geography. This enemy comes against Israel from the north. 38, 15, thou shalt come from thy place out of the north. Chapter 39, verse 2, I'll turn you back, leave but the sixth part of thee, will cause you to come up from the north. Jeremiah sees a great shaking at the end time and says in chapter 1, verse 13, the word of the Lord came unto me the second time, saying, Son of man, what seest thou? And he said, I see a seething pot. Seething? Boiling. Trouble? Where? In the north. The king of the north, Daniel 11, verse 40. Tidings out of the east, Orient, head out of the north, Russia, shall trouble him who? The Antichrist who sits in a temple in Jerusalem during this time of war. Now, Dr. Dehan, that great prophetical scholar, before his death, said that there would be an invasion of Israel from the north and went on to say on his worldwide radio network of stations, I challenge any man on the verse I'm about to give because the only nation on earth that can meet the geographical requirements of this verse happens to be Russia. What verse is it? It's an important one. I'll mention it a few times in this message. Joel 2 verse 20. I will remove far off from you the northern army. We'll drive him into a land barren and desolate, Siberia, with his face toward the East Sea and his hinder part toward the uttermost sea. The only thing uttermost north of Israel with a barren area, Siberia, and two oceans or seas is the USSR or Russia. When one sees so much going on in the Middle East and realizes that the Bible predicts Russia is going to play a major role in all this and knows that God has predicted this very thing to happen for the last days. He says within his heart, Jesus Christ's coming must be near. Who is going to unite with the communist bloc? Well, 38.5 says Persia. Persia changed its name in 1932 to Iran. All Persia takes in Iran and Iraq. Then notice it says Ethiopia and Libya, parts of Africa. Now, this is interesting. Daniel chapter 11, verses 40 to 44, also mentions these two nations, Ethiopia and Libya, but couples with the two, Egypt. Don't miss it. Egypt. Many Bible teachers believe that Russia will come to the aid of Egypt, the English-speaking nations to the aid of Israel, as we'll see. The next name one sees is Gomer and all his bands. Gibbons in his writings, The Fall and Decline of the Roman Empire, volume 1, page 204, says Gomer is modern Germany. This man, Gibbons, is praised by Encyclopedia Britannica for his reliable reporting of historical facts. What did you say, Gibbons? I said it's Germany. The oldest maps of the world where we now have Germany located originally had Gomer, Gomerland, Gomeria, and Ashkenaz, his son, listed. And so we believe 
that as we've seen this division, East and West Germany, under the communist way of dividing the world after World War II, that it's indicative of the fact that we have the exact alignment with the exception of a few nations moving over one way or the other. So the next name we see then is Tagarma of the North. Dr. Edmund of Wheaton College spent many hours on this one word and all of his research indicated one thing, that Tagarma was Turkey, Turkey of the North. North of Israel is Turkey, which also would take in Syria because Haik, H-E-I-K, came down from Tagarma, Turkey, and fathered the people of Syria. Many of you have heard this expression, the great northern bear, and the reason you've heard it is this, Magog, Meshach, Tubal, and Hrash form the Soviet Union. Persia takes in Iran and Iraq, Tagarma takes in Turkey and Syria, and so there is a great northern block of nations moving to the Middle East in the last days called the great northern bear. Now, who is going to also be involved with this communist block of nations as far as the oriental world is concerned. I don't know whether they're going to come together unified, amalgamated, or if they're going to come separately, each to get what he can get, but the Bible pictures that both armies from the north, Russia, and from the east, China, are going to move into the Middle East. Tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Daniel 11, 44. The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. The waters there were dried up so that the way of the kings of the east, Orient, might be prepared. Not only that, the Bible pictures them coming out of the Orient as swarms and multitudes. For the number of the army was 200,000, thousand. Revelation 9, 16, and I'll have more to say about that. All right. We see the various armies. Who is going to raise a voice of opposition? What about the opposing side? 38, 13, Sheba, Dedan, and the merchants of Tarsus. According to the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, Sheba and Dedan are some of the Arabs, Muslims, who will not go along with a unified Arab pack. Then we see the term Tarsus. It's found 20 times in the Bible, and every time it's the land farthest west of Israel or Great Britain. Notice it says merchants of Tarsus, for they traded goods around the world, and when this portion of Scripture was written, there was only one way to trade goods, and that was through ships. Do you remember the slogans of history? Britannia rules the waves, England the mistresses of the seas. Thirdly, the ancient Phoenicians and others got all of their tin from Tarshish. Britain means land of tin. But listen, it says Tarshish with all her young lions. The symbol on top of the American flag is the eagle and the symbol on top of the English flag is the lion. Tarshish, the mother lion with all her young lions, the English speaking nations of the world. And so there we see our two armies almost the way we see everything being positioned presently and all we can say within ourselves when we see it is how much longer do we have before this blitzkrieg breaks out upon the earth there will also be a union of western nations as depicted prophetically in daniel chapter 2 and daniel chapter 7. nebuchadnezzar the king had a dream and couldn't remember what it was all about. So he called in all of his magicians, soothsayers, astrologers, fortune tellers, and said, tell me what I dreamt or I'll kill you. Wow. Daniel went to prayer. God gave the answer and he came back and said, Nebuchadnezzar, the Lord revealed to me your dream. Come on. Really? What was it? Well, you had a dream about a great image and it had a head of gold two arms and chest of silver, a stomach of brass, legs of iron, and then ten toes of iron and clay. The clay typifying a deterioration. Why, you're a genius. No, I've talked to my God Jehovah, and he told me what it was. But King, he also told me what it all meant. 
And I hate to bring you sad tidings, but nevertheless, God wants me to tell it to you. Go ahead, Daniel. I won't punish you for it. Tell me the truth. You are that head of gold, Babylon. But there are two powers, the Medes and the Persians, typified by the two arms that are going to destroy you. It happened, friend. You who are skeptical of the Bible, study history. It happened. Many said there will be an empire of brass typified by the stomach, representing Greece, and it will smash the two arms, the Medes and the Persians. It happened. And then there will be two legs of iron, representing the power of Rome, the Roman Empire. Why two legs? Because at one time the kingdom was divided between Rome and Constantinople. And these two legs will smash the power of Greece typified by the stomach of brass. Now notice that there is never a power that smashes the Roman Empire. You see, the Roman Empire fell because of wickedness, sin, and degradation. Much of the same sin we see transpiring in the world presently. Gibbons in his writings, The Fall and Decline of the Roman Empire, mentions that Rome and its power fell because of internal corruption. And then at the end, notice the ten toes are still iron, meaning that the Roman Empire is revived, for the iron comes back. The toes wiggle. It's a deteriorated form with clay, but nevertheless, it comes back into existence. Wasn't long ago we saw nine Western nations getting together. There are going to be ten when it's all finally settled. We have lived even to see this. Oh, my friend, all these nations are binding together. It's all getting ready for the great surge. What hour do you think it is? Jesus must be coming soon. The next question is, where is it all going to take place? Cuba? No. Korea? No. Germany? No. I have preached all through the times when there were wars and rumors of wars that the big battlefield would be the Middle East. Seventeen times in these two chapters it says the Middle East. Listen carefully. 38.8 against the mountains of Israel. 38.16 thou shalt come up against my people of Israel. 38.19 surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. 39.2 I'll turn you back leave but the sixth part of thee will cause you to come up from the north parts and bring you upon the mountains of Israel. 39.4 thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel. Israel, 39, 12, 7 months shall the house of Israel be bearing of them. It's going to be in the Middle East. And when one sees all the present trouble that's going on in the Middle East and all that's going on, he can only say within himself, the coming of the Lord must be near. For I repeat it, most Bible teachers believe that when Russia marches on Israel, the church of Jesus Christ is gone. Now why are they going to move down? 38, 12, to take a spoil and to take a prey. They're going to see what they can get. Oh, there's nothing there, really. First of all, there's a thousand-mile oil line. I've repeatedly preached for 15 years in America that much of it would have to do with oil. Secondly, there's the Dead Sea worth $2 trillion. Oh, you say, how much is that? No one knows that unless they're television repairmen or insurance collectors. <laughs> Thirdly, and this is the most important reason. I believe that it's going to be the greatest time of anti-Semitism in the history of the world. This will be the devil's last attempt to liquidate, obliterate, and blot out the Jew. The devil hates the Jew. And 38.16 says, Thou shall come up against my people of Israel. I say the devil hates the Jew. God set his love upon Israel. Deuteronomy 7.7. 7. Don't ask me why. God loved them. Ask him. And this love has remained. Though there have been times when God was disappointed with Israel. Though there have been times when judgment fell on them. There's always been a love in his heart for them. One day said, I'm going to send my son into the world. Jesus didn't begin 1900 years ago. He always was. Micah 5 verse 2. He's from everlasting. But God said, I want to send him into the world. What race shall I choose? Imagine he bypassed the Belgians. He said, I'm going to choose a Jewish virgin. He allowed Jews to write the Old Testament and Jews to write the New Testament. Many, of course, converted out of Judaism into Christianity. Oh, he loved these people. But this will be the last attempt to obliterate, liquidate, murder every Jew upon the face of the earth. But let me say at this point in the message, it won't happen. But God still loves his people. 
Though there will be a time of trial and persecution, Jacob's trouble, Jacob is Israel, Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Yet God will be on the side of his ancient people, Israel. He still loves them. Now we're going to examine the war itself. World War III in the Middle East, when Russia marches on Israel. I'm going to be using tribulation texts because most prophetical Bible teachers believe that Russia marches on Israel during the tribulation hour. And I'm going to say immediately that what I'm about to picture is horrible. The conflagration in the Middle East will make World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, or anything else that we might have before it happens look like a Sunday school picnic by way of comparison. The first thing we see is the largest armies in the history of the world. Ezekiel 38, 16, Thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud swarms and swarms of them. John gets a glimpse of that coming morning in Revelation 9, verse 16, and cries out, The number of the army was 200,000, 200 million. Why, that's the population of the United States of America, right? And these are pictured as coming out of the Orient, right? Impossible, fantastic, ridiculous, absurd, really? The Associated Press in the United States of America estimated that one out of every five in China had been trained for warfare, and because their population is going to reach the one billion mark, one out of five means 200,000, 200 million, the exact figure of the book of Revelation. What a God, what a Bible to give us the exact details hundreds of years in advance. Secondly, we see the deadliest weapons. I'm talking to you skeptics now, you who've mocked the Bible, you who've often said these things can never happen. Get out the oldest version you can find. Look up 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. And there you will find the clearest identification mark that you'll discover anywhere in any library concerning what the A and H bomb really is. It says, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth and the works that are therein shall be burned. Mr. Scientist, tell us a little bit about the effects of a nuclear blast. Very well. First of all, there's a tremendous mushrooming effect as the blast takes place and it ascends into the heavenlies. 1900 years ago the Apostle Peter had the picture of this thing and said the heavens pass away with the noise thereof. Secondly, the scientist declares that as it comes in a downward direction it disintegrates, dissolves, melts everything, even steel so that a 500 foot steel tower in New Mexico melted to the ground and they found nothing. Peter secondly said the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Now that couldn't just happen, that was God Almighty telling Peter what to write 19 centuries ahead of time. Notice the word elements. The elements shall melt. Go to the library and say to the library, I want to study the A or H bomb and she'll take you to the letter E to the word elements. For the scientist classifies these bombs under the term elements. And yet Peter had the exact word hundreds of years in advance. Now, it was not because he was some great intellect, because he was a genius. It was because God wrote this book. Now, let me prove that. Concerning Peter, Acts 4.13 says, When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned. So it wasn't Peter. But this same man, the Apostle Peter, says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. He says, I as well as others were directed by the Holy Spirit of God to write these things. Now the scientist thirdly says that the desert became a sea of blazing, burning gas or gases. And the apostle Peter thirdly says the earth and the works that are therein shall be burned. 
Now, I believe that 2 Peter chapter 3 is for a later hour. It's for the end of the world, and the end of the world is nowhere near because this old world is going on for at least another 1,000 years under the rulership of Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And we Christians are going to rule with the Lord, for they lived and reigned with Jesus Christ 1,000 years, Revelation 20, verse 4. However, I do see a war of fire involving atoms and hydrogens as I study other parts of the scripture, and then 2 Peter 3 as the final culmination. Now, what other verses have to do with a war of fire? Psalm 97, 3, a fire goeth before him. Isaiah 66, 15, for behold, the Lord will come with fire. Ezekiel 20, 47, the flaming flame shall not be quenched. Now I'm going to Joel chapter 2, for remember earlier in the message we pictured in verse 20 the northern army being driven back to Siberia, but now we see them on their way to Israel, to the Middle East, and Joel 2 verse 3 says a fire devours before them. And as they're being pushed back, Joel sees this in verse 31, blood, fire, and pillars of smoke, the exact effects of a nuclear blast. Zephaniah 1.18, the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. Malachi 4.1, the day cometh that shall burn as in heaven. Revelation 8.7, a third part of the trees was burned, all green grass was burned, and I want to pause there for a moment, because it says a third part of the earth was burned. Do you know that I took the Life Pictorial Atlas magazine, the latest edition, and I looked at the countries by name that would be involved in this war with Russia and against Russia, and when I told their square mileage, it came out to exactly, exactly one-third of the earth, which makes me to believe that that which is ahead of us is the war that's prophesied in this book. And then again, the Bible tells us in Revelation 16, 8, men were scorched with a great heat. And this again, pictures the blast of an A or H bomb. Oh, what a war it's going to be. How terrible, how devastating. The largest armies in the history of the world, the deadliest weapons. I don't know if you've been studying recently as to what's going on in this whole world, but we are slipping in America while Russia's moving ahead with the latest missiles to carry their hydrogen bombs to every part of the world. And they have a bomb a megaton bomb that's so powerful now that it's literally frightening. One exploding in the ocean could cause a tidal wave that would reach across this nation hundreds and hundreds of miles. Oh, my friend, I want to tell you we're living in the last days. It's not a beautiful picture, but it's a picture telling us that the coming of Jesus Christ is near. There's very little hope unless one knows the Lord and realizes that this is Bible prophecy and then can lift his head heavenward and say, Oh, Jesus, I believe it's indicative of the fact that you're coming. I believe these are signs of the times. Amen. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Thirdly, we see the bloodiest battle. Now, I want you to notice this because there are those who tell us this war has already been fought. It happened hundreds of years ago. Wait a minute. As we consider the verses to follow, Notice that every one of them says this, there never will have been anything like this in the past, nor shall there ever be anything like it again in the future. This will be the culmination. Jeremiah 30, verse 7, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. Daniel 12, And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was, never, since there was a nation. You think this has already happened? You're mistaken. The prophet Joel, in chapter 2, verse 1, cries out, Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh. A day of darkness and of gloominess. A day of clouds and of thick darkness. In verse 10, he says, The whole world quakes or shakes before this enemy. And who is this enemy? Verse 20, the northern army that's pushed back to Siberia. The world does what? Quakes before them. Oh, we have been so lulled and duped in America. 
We have been told that communists now are great. We have nothing to fear. They're going to keep all their treaties. And so we sign every kind of pact and agreement with them. But let me tell you, friend, very frankly, they haven't honored most of their treaties in the past, and they're not going to in the future. Oh, there's a sad hour coming on this world as communism moves and the world quakes before them because of their torturous, barbarous methods in liquidating people. Listen to me, communism has already murdered nearly 100 million people in Russia, in China, as these Bolsheviks marched in, and many of them killed their own loved ones and family members. It's not over. We see the stirrings in all of the countries as communism is gaining control of labor unions and causing chaos, confusion, and it's all headed for something drastic sooner than most of us think. The world quakes before them. My friend, I want you to know right now that we've got communists in government We've got them in the military, we've got them in the school systems, we've got them in our churches, and they're still a threat for Gus Hall, the leader of the American Party, who even ran for president, has now withdrawn the statement he made a number of years ago saying, I'll not be satisfied till I see the blood and guts of every congressman, senator, and preacher going down the sewer. Yes. If you Christians, he goes on to say, want to see blood, you'll see blood as we drag you over your altar rails. Oh, what a time it's going to be. Jesus Christ could say in Matthew 24, 21, for then shall be great tribulation such as never was since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. It's not going to be the end of the world, but at least one-third of the people of the world will die, and perhaps when one puts all of the figures of the book of Revelation together, one-half but in one verse, Revelation 9, 18, it says, By these three was the third part of men killed. Not only that, but the Bible says in Revelation 14, 20, that the blood came out of the winepress to the horses' bridles by the space of 1,600 furlongs. In American calculations, that's a river of blood 200 miles long. And what? we're really being told is this, that the entire land of Israel from one end to the other will be steep, soaked, and saturated in blood for it is 200 miles long. The bloodiest battle. But wait a minute. We find fourthly that it's going to be the greatest defeat and funeral for any nation in the history of this old world because communism is going to be smashed by the power of God Almighty. Now, as we examine Ezekiel 39, verses 1 and 2, I'm going to quote them exactly like they were interpreted in chapter 38, for they're the same names as you'll see. Behold, I'm against the Ogog, the Rosh, Russia, Russian prince of Moscow and Tobolsk, and I'll turn you back and leave but the sixth part of thee. Five, six of their armies are going to fall, so much so that chapter 39, verse 12 says, Seven months shall the house of Israel be burying of them that they may cleanse the land. Every available worker will do nothing but bury the dead for seven solid months. Oh, there'll be employment. Believe me, there'll be employment. And one-sixth of their armies will be driven back to Siberia. And there it is again, Joel 2, verse 20. I'll remove far off from you the northern army. will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea. The hordes of communism smashed, smashed forever. Oh, some of these political parties think that they can shake a fist heavenward and mock God. Sometimes saying, we don't believe there is such a being, and then at other times denying their own statements. <laughs> They've even gone so far as to say, we're going to drag this bearded villain from the heaven. That's strange if he doesn't exist. That's just like a lot of you atheists. You say there's no God, but you know when you get around 75, 78 years of age, and you think you're going to die, you change your terminology. Now there's a God, and you'll meet him. And communism is going to meet God in the Middle East. And they're going to be smashed, and the other six of their army will be driven back to Siberia. What a time it's going to be. The question arises, when will all of this begin? 
Ezekiel 38, 8 and 16, the latter years and the latter days. God says in the latter years and the latter days, Russia will become a great military power, and she has. What hard do you think it is then? In the latter years and latter days, these nations will align themselves. They have. Very little must still occur. What hour do you think it is then? God says in the latter years and latter days, Israel will become a nation and she will be hated and these nations will march against the Jew in his own land. And they had no land until 1948. And 17 times in these two chapters, they march against the Jew in his land. Since you've lived to see the Jew in his land, 1948, what hour do you think it is? For God says all of these things are for the latter years and the latter days. Now, I want to show you something very interesting. Take these chapters, Ezekiel 36, 37, 38, 39, and 40, and study them. Chapter 36, verse 24, is a picture of the Jews coming from all nations. I will take you from among the heathen, Gentiles, gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. They've come from 120 nations, speaking 83 languages, and all in your lifetime. What are you going to do, God? I'm going to bring them from all the lands of the world to their own land. All right, in chapter 37, there's the vision of the valley of the dry bones. Remember the spiritual? Them bones, them bones, them dry bones, them bones, them bones, them dry bones. You didn't know I could sing. I can't. There's a message, though, in that chapter. They come back from the nations of the world where they have been scattered for 2,000 years, where they have died practically, where they've almost become non-existent, where they almost lost their identity. And God says in the last day there will be a stirring among these bones. Skin will come on them. They'll come back to life. And then so that no one misses it, he tells us what he means in chapter 37, verse 11. These bones are the whole house of Israel. Becoming a nation. 1948, the Jew pulled up his flag, the six-pointed star of David. So one can write above chapter 36 and chapter 37, the date, 1948. Well, that's when Israel started to live after being dead as a nation for 2,000 years. All right? Chapter 40 is Messiah on earth. Of course, we Christians believe that will be our Jesus. Now watch this. Chapter 36 and 37, the Jews going home. 1948, chapter 40, Messiah returns, and between the two events, the Jews going home and becoming a nation and Messiah returning, you have chapter 38 and 39 where Russia marches in the Middle East. Remember what I said earlier? Russia goes with Egypt. Daniel chapter 11, verses 40 to 44. And the English-speaking people go with Israel. We see the alignment. We see everything taking place. And I believe that when this thing is ready to break, we Christians will be gone. I personally believe it's very near. Do you know that the man who inspired the writing of the book, The Late Great Planet Earth, said, he was a rabbi, every Israeli school child studies the Bible for 11 years in the system, and he knows that there's going to be an invasion from the north. He knows that it will be in the latter years and latter days, Ezekiel 38, verse 8 and 16, and he knows it will be just before Messiah returns. Now, the Jewish people look for Messiah. The Christian looks for the coming of Jesus in the clouds seven years sooner. So we believe that after we are gone, this war takes place, and they believe that the war takes place, and then Messiah comes to the earth. We're not trying to say anything about theories right now. What we're trying to say is that even the Jewish people concerning their Messiah believe that it ties in closely with the coming of Messiah. And as one sees Russia making preparations and realizes that they believe this ties in with the coming of their Messiah, and we Christians believe that it ties in with the coming of our Savior Jesus to call us away first, we're gone when it happens and is getting ready to happen, how much time do you really think we have left? In the Jerusalem paper, it stated, When you see Russia getting ready to cross the Dardanelles, put on your Sabbath garments, and get ready for the coming of Messiah, we're living right in the last hours of history. 
Jesus Christ is coming soon. I personally believe that when this thing looks like it shall break, and that all the nations will be involved in World War III, a great leader will come to the fore on a peace platform, and he'll say, peace, peace, peace. He'll fly from one nation to the other and make peace. And he'll sign the contracts with Israel and others. Daniel chapter 9. And the world will say, this is it, utopia, peace. No more of that which we've known, heartache and war. But he only keeps his agreement for 42 months. And in the middle of Daniel's 70th week, in the middle of the seven-year period of tribulation, he breaks the contract, Daniel 9, 27. After the 42 months of peace has expired, all negotiations are finished, and Russia marches. But wait a minute. Before this one can come to power on the peace platform, before he can have full sway, to bring this false peace for three and one half years, we Christians must be gone. You say, how do you know that, Jack? Well, this Antichrist will sit in a temple in Jerusalem, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4. And he'll make blasphemy out of the Jewish people's temple. And the Bible says, you know what withstraineth, it, what withholdeth, what? And then in verse 7 of 2 Thessalonians 2, it says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth, and that's the old English word for hindereth, only he who now hindereth will hinder until he be taken out of the way, until he be removed. Who is hindering the coming of Antichrist? I'll tell you, the Holy Spirit. And he has to be removed before this world leader can come into prominence over the Middle East situation. But... The thrilling thing is that that spirit lives in the hearts of Christians. For if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of Christ. Romans 8, 9. He dwelleth in you. Look up all these verses. 1 Corinthians 3, 16. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. He lives in us. And if he has to be removed, he can't be removed unless we Christians are removed because he's part of us. And the Antichrist, the power of Satan, through a man, cannot come into existence until that Holy Spirit living in us is removed. That's why I believe one of the next events will be Revelation 4.1. Come up hither, and in the twinkling of an eye we Christians will be taken. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, the dead, to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. I believe that's the next thing. That's when the Spirit is removed and believers with him because he lives in us. And so when it looks like Russia will go to war and it looks like all nations will become involved, immediately a man will arise saying, peace, peace, and bring peace for 42 months. But I believe that the restrainer, the Holy Spirit, is first taken before he can come to power. Study it again, 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. And when he's taken, we're taken, for he lives in our hearts. My question to you now, are you ready? Is he living in your heart? Have you received Jesus Christ? Get saved today. You folks who are backslidden away from God, come home. Be ready. Tomorrow may be too late.